Okay, uh, good evening everyone. My name is Susan Watt and I will be moderating the session tonight for OTF Connects. Welcome to all of you. We have a great group from right across the province. We have a large group that are interested in this, uh, this up and coming exciting topic. Um, I'd like to introduce Scott McKenzie. Scott and I are colleagues in the Waterloo region. Um, I've worked with Scott. I've visited his classroom. He's uh, doing excellent work in this area. I know he's very passionate about it. This is his first OTF Connects webinar, so I'm really excited to be introducing him to this platform and to all of you as, uh, as a great voice in the area of coding in the curriculum. So his topic tonight is coding um, in mathematics curriculum in the primary area, and he's got a lot of great stuff to share. So welcome everyone and a really warm welcome to you, Scott. I'm going to turn my microphone off and let you go. Thank you, Susan. I appreciate that. Uh, good evening. Uh, if everybody wants to give me a thumbs up just in the chat so that I can see you're hearing me or even a green chat mark, that would be great. Okay. Good. Okay. It looks like I'm coming across fairly clearly. Uh, so my name is Scott McKenzie. I am an elementary teacher and I've taught a lot in the primary division. I've also taught uh, up to grade 5-6. I've never taught uh, intermediate, but I've always been passionate about getting students doing stuff that gets them more motivated to, to work in class and to do their own creating. And um, coding was the perfect fit for that. Like many people, I started with the Hour of Code. That was my first real experience with it a few years ago. And after doing so, I wanted to move beyond that and start to tie it more into the curriculum so that it made sense and I could kind of share with parents how we were using it in a, in a meaningful way. So I'm going to talk about that a bit tonight and uh, here we go. So first of all, why integrate coding into the curriculum? Uh, kids love creating and building and doing. So from Lego to Minecraft, coding is just kind of that next step. It's just more powerful. It's kind of like bit strips on steroids. There's just so much you can do with it. Um, I find that if you approach it the right way and you look at the math in the coding that they're doing, it helps deepen their understanding of both the coding and the math that they're using. So I find that's really helpful. Um, it builds their confidence with these types of computational skills, which is huge. Um, it's a tool they can use to show their learning. So sometimes in my class, a student will use Google Slides. Another student might build a website. Someone might do a poster on paper. Uh, someone might use Minecraft. And then I'll have a student who codes a, a game or a, an interactive quiz that just shares their knowledge. So it's just another way that they can share their learning in the classroom. Um, what I love about Scratch is that it involves creative skills, critical thinking skills, and their computational thinking skills. And in different ways, those all come out when using this program. So I always like to relate back to curriculum. And looking through the math curriculum, on page 7, this, this struck me, this, this one part of the, of the page, where it said teachers have used a variety. So we don't want to do things in just one way. We want to give them different options and, and different ways to show their learning and to do their math in different ways. So coding isn't the only way to do it. It's, it's not something we should use every time. But having it as an option, especially when it works well with what we're teaching, it just gives that, that extra option and a different way that they can think about their learning, problem solve, and, and work through the math. Um, it's, it's a real life skill and it's something that they can use in the real world so they can actually build a program that does something and it's, it's real, like coding a robot. So in that way, it becomes part of the, of the bigger world that they'll be a part of in the future and they get to see how that math works in the real world. Um, looking at the mathematical processes as well, um, I feel myself that all of these are hit on when we use uh, coding. So with problem solving, as soon as you try to put math into a program, my students have been coding a clock. So getting the hands to move at the right time, that was a huge problem for them to figure out. And then the reasoning they had to do to work on that um, figuring out how they were going to do it. And as they worked away, they constantly have to reflect on what's working and what's not working. The nice thing about coding is that they see everything happening on the stage, 
and they can test what they did. So almost immediately after changing one piece of code, they can run the program and see what's happening. So they're constantly reflecting and proving that their code works before they move on. Um, connecting their work to other students is something else they can do. So when they remix a project in Scratch, uh, instantly they're connected to that, to that project. So we see it all. There's a tree that you can click on. I'll show you later. So all the programs, they connect to each other and the skills that they're using, they can, co they can communicate with each other as well. I've had my students work with students from different classes around the province and even in different countries. And they work on, pro on the same types of projects and then they share what they did with each other when they're done. So they get to see a slightly different way of using the math but coming to the same result. Um, Michael Fullen, I feel the way he looks at, at deep learning and how we're changing our model of, of delivering our programming to students. This is, oh, sorry, this is a link to that which will be in the, um, in the resources that Susan shares later. And this is a, a good graphic from that that I thought really helped. So in, in the old way of doing things, we'd walk down to a computer lab and we might use tech at that time. We'd be basically trying to increase our, our knowledge about something and we just try to memorize it and master that, that content. Um, what we're trying to move towards is, is a situation where students and teachers alike, the information's available, it's freely available nowadays on the internet. So as we can access and learn new things, we want students to, to move to that next step and start to create and design things with their new knowledge. So they're using that knowledge and hopefully even in an impactful way so that they're, they're doing something with it and they're creating something new that doesn't already exist. And coding is definitely a good tool for them to use for that because they're designing and creating new projects, things that are in their imagination and taking the knowledge that they've learned and putting those together. And this was a study across, I believe it was seven countries and they were asking teachers where they were at with technology use and the creation of the knowledge students were learning, how they were using that knowledge and these are some of the different ways. So if you're feeling, if you're feeling brave, if you want to put a clip art uh, check mark or smiley face besides maybe the, the highest position on this graph that you think you use in your class now, just reading through, just see where you think you're at in your own practice in your own classroom right now. So the clip art again is at the bottom. And if you're on a mobile device, an iPad or other, if you want to just put it in the chat window, that'd be great. Excellent. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, I, I love seeing that there's a lot of symbols up at the top. So that's, that's exactly where we want to be. And if you haven't used Scratch or coding much in the class yet, I just want you to know that uh, developing simulations or animations is exactly what we do with code in Scratch. And sharing that with others is easy because once you share the project, it becomes live and it has a link that's on the internet and it can be freely shared with students anywhere or others anywhere in the world. So that's awesome that so many of you are doing that and hopefully more of us will be doing it by the end of the evening. I'm going to move to the next slide now. Thanks for your input. So right now a lot of students consume and I mean we watch them, they're playing games, they're, they're doing things on the internet. Some of them do actually do a lot of creating as well. They, they use apps that allow for that and I mean it's great when they do that. 
And what we really want to do is, is foster that creativity in them and have them be the designers of their, their own digital space so that they're building and creating what their, their environment looks like as opposed to just using what everybody else has given them. And, and that's our hope is that we can move the students in that direction. Here we have, um, so with Fullen, he says that the six C's will come from that deeper learning. And if you are willing to click on the text box, which has the A and some lines, if you want to look these over, we have character education, citizenship, communication, critical thinking and problem solving, collaboration, and creativity and imagination. If you want to just type in where you think coding fits or something that you think does fit with coding in any of these areas, if you don't feel that you want to type something, if you want to put a smiley face or a check mark beside the ones that you think do fit, that would be great. Okay, all areas, Karen, that's great. And uh, Christina, I see critical thinking, problem solving, collaboration, absolutely. In my classroom, we are lucky enough to have a device for every student, but I still often have them work with a partner when they're coding. We have the pilot and the co-pilot, so one person's offering advice, the other person has got their hands on the keyboard, and then they switch as they're working so they both get opportunities. Excellent. Uh, Joe, we use uh, Chromebooks in our classroom. Although we, I mean, we have a Raspberry Pi as well and a Cano and, and iPads, but for coding we primarily use the, for the most part, we use the Chromebooks. And creativity and critical thinking, absolutely. Um, character education and citizenship, the students also, when they remix a project in Scratch, uh, they, it automatically attributes it to the original project and we talk about doing that and if they got the information or ideas or even code from a different project, I'm teaching them to put that information in where they can thank people. There's a built-in spot in the Scratch project where they share how they've helped people. And it, it can be a challenge to have enough technology. I would agree with that, Mark. Um, it, it is hard, but getting the access, even if it's once a week, it, it does make a big difference. Okay, so I'm showing you a, a slide now of Scratch Junior, and Scratch Junior is like kind of like a gateway app to moving into Scratch. I use this at the beginning year of my students. And we go down to the kindergarten classroom, and I have them be the teachers, and I'll, we'll learn how to use the, the app, and then we'll go down and we'll teach them how to make their own code, their own apps, so that they can work with math or work with language. And the kindergarten students love Scratch Junior. It's very hands-on. Uh, there's no language in this. So even for your classroom, regardless of the grade, if you have students that are older, uh, but have struggle with the language and are having difficulty, Scratch Junior does a lot of similar things. Uh, it's not as full featured, but there's no language in the block. So they can use this program or work on it sometimes to share their learning. And it, it's just, it scaffolds the learning for them. Um, once the students are ready though, I do like to move them into Scratch just because there's so many more options that they can gradually learn as they move along. Uh, yes, we, it's Coding Buddies, that's right. Um, so, we have here on the screen, so you'll see there's the sprite, there's the blocks of code. Uh, each separate set of blocks that are together is a different script, and all these scripts are doing different things. They are sometimes running simultaneously or running when something happens. Um, the palette code blocks here that you'll see, um, there's event blocks, motion blocks, looks, sounds, uh, there's control blocks. All of this shows up in the full Scratch program as well. And there's the stage, and you can have multiple stages, and students can create a, a more complex project. They can do a lot with this. Uh, one challenge this year, I had them build Hangman, which was fairly 
tricky, but they did manage to pull it off, and it involved a lot of sprites and a lot of stages. Scraps can be used only on computers currently, Jenna. Um, the hope is that they're moving to a post-Flash world. Um, as time goes by, Google's working now with MIT to try and create something that will work on mobile devices as well. It's just not quite ready. But they're working on it, and Google wants it to, to continue to be accessible by students. Uh, they, they like the, the Scratch program. And yeah, Scratch Junior absolutely is not just for kindergarten students. We use it in grade three. Uh, and as I said, like you could, you could use it in grade six. You could do things with grade six students with Scratch Junior easily. Uh, Scratch accounts, yes, they do need to have those. And I'm going to show you tonight how to make your own educator Scratch account. And you can add your students that way. And then you have all your students with a username and a, a login, and it's all ready to go. So we'll be able to set that up this evening. So I'll just show on this slide here that Scratch Junior leads to Scratch. So everything that they see in Scratch Junior is very similar in Scratch. And they can get started with Scratch at a very young age because it looks familiar and they understand what the blocks do. And as soon as they can read what the words say, that's really the only thing that holds them back. And yes, both programs are completely free. Um, MIT, it's, it's, the kinder, it's the Lifetime Kindergarten uh, Group, I think is their name. And it all goes back to Seymour Papert, who was kind of the, the grandfather of, of coding in, with young children, and did a lot of stuff uh, back at, like around 1980. And so this has been developed and built up for, for years. And I think Scratch was online about 1990, or no, maybe 2005, and has been running since then. So it's always been free, it's, and they have no no wish to change that. Oh, 2005. Thanks, Mark. Okay. So here's some blocks of code here. And you can see uh, there's short scripts that students can do. I'm just going to grab a. Okay. Hopefully you can see a finger pointing now. Um, so we can start with a fairly simple script like this. Um, when the space key is pressed, clear everything on the screen, point in a certain direction, and go to this spot. So that's kind of a reset for students. That is one of the first things we teach them because we have to reset what was happening in the program with the sprite at the beginning. And then we can move on to creating a shape. If you're, if you're familiar with Scratch, you might know what this is right away. But if you look at the code, so we're putting a pen down to draw something. And then repeating two times, we're moving 20 steps, turning 60 degrees, moving 40 steps, and turning 120 degrees. So if you want to take a guess at what shape that would be, or maybe you already know, and you could put that in the chat box. What shape do you think that would be? Scott, sorry for the interruption. Just really quickly, if you want to use the, the finger pointer, like the pointer, just make sure you're holding it down with your mouse. It doesn't. There you go. We can see it now. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Susan. I should have told uh, you that before. Rookie presenter. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Now, now you can actually see the finger. Okay. So yeah, here we go. And don't forget that repeats twice. And I've already seen the correct answer show up. Uh, Gail's got it. Parallelogram. So, and we'll see this later. Our, the last project tonight is sorting uh, 2D shapes. So we'll look at that a little later. But so moving 20 steps, turning 60 degrees, moving 40 steps. Uh, we already know it's not going to be a rhombus. And then the 120 degrees and the 60 degrees, we've got the bigger and smaller 90 degrees uh, giving us a parallelogram. All right, and then we've got a more, this is something that I might give the students in a project to use, but I wouldn't expect them to be able to do all this coding at the beginning. And, and I think that scaffolding the learning for them, giving them projects that are a bit more complex and having them work with parts of the code, that's, that's perfectly all right to do. And so they won't understand or use all of this at the beginning, but they'll work with parts of it. 
and they'll learn parts of it. And then what they can do is they can go back to that project and they'll take this code and they'll use it in a different project they're working on because they know that this sets up asking a question, getting input, and then having an output that it does as well. So they can learn these more complex uh, coding skills as they move along and as they're ready to use them. The nice thing is by scaffolding and building the program for students and having them work with parts of it, they can, we can start to take away more and more and give them more options for their own creativity and their own way to figure things out. Um, progressively go over the fundamental concepts? Absolutely. Um, they work their way into lessons that I teach throughout the year. They'll also be teaching a mathematic concept and then I'll just pull in one coding concept and add that in as well. Um, so with making shapes, often the repeat blocks become useful, so that's when I'll introduce those. And it, yeah, it's, gradually re it's gradual release. They forget things. We revisit them. I have one student who figures out how to do something, and then they'll show it to other students. Okay, I'm going to move on. If I'm missing any questions, uh, Susan, feel free to let me know, please. So uh, what I would like you to do, if you already have a Scratch account, that's phenomenal, and I won't, um, I won't force this on you. This just is new this year, the teacher accounts. Um, and I would ask you to open this link up in, in your website, of ch or, sorry, your browser of choice. I would use Chrome if possible because it does work the best with Scratch. Um, Firefox works well. Uh, basically, your last option, unfortunately, is um, well, what's Internet Explorer even called now? But um, it's, it's a bit buggy, but I find all the other browsers work pretty good. Edge, thank you. Yes. So I haven't had great luck with that, but I find Chrome works the best. Firefox is also really good. Uh, with, with Safari, sometimes you have to update your Flash, and um, really your best with Chrome if possible. So if you want to go ahead and make an educator account, this is going to take a few minutes. But once you've created that, you'll be able to work right away in the program tonight and save everything that we do. So if you get a chance to try something, you'll be able to go to the projects that I've shared and click on the remix button, which I'll, sh I'll show you in a bit. And then you'll have those, those programs and you'll be able to use them. It takes about 24 hours to be approved for an educator uh, website. But if you, you can work in it tonight and you'll be able to load your students in before the end of the week. They're usually very quick on the turnaround. Um, I have more than one educator account, so I used my, my own school board email for one. And to do some testing, I used uh, another email that wasn't, and they approved both for educator status. So if you want to go ahead and do that now, and then we'll move into starting some projects. And as you've got your account set up, if you want to just give a green check or even just a I'm ready in the chat, 
that'd be great. And once most of us are done, I'm going to start to the next section. And uh, no, they've, Joe, they've never called me, um, and I've had other teachers I'm working with this coding in my board this year. None of them have gotten a phone call. I, I think that's just to test the validity of hopefully that the person really is a teacher, and then if there's anything weird with the account, I guess they have someone they can call. Uh, the website link was posted in the chat. If you just kind of scroll back up, um, you'll see register for Scratch at 7.52 p.m. And if you click the link, that'll get you there. Oh, thank you. Awesome. <laughs> Mary Beth, if you just scroll back up a couple of lines, uh, Susan posted the link again. Okay, for the sake of time, I'm going to start a video, and it's just a short tutorial of two, a 12-second dialogue. So something that we often start students with is simply having two sprites communicate with each other, and I'll take you to that now. You can watch this on your own. Susan has posted the link to it. But I'll play it on the screen here. If hopefully that's going to show up nicely Scott, for everyone. Scott, There's I wouldn't play it on lag. the screen. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I would. Okay. I'm going to recommend that we that everyone watches it on their own using the link that's in the um, in the chat. You, you're happy to. You can keep up that screen, but I wouldn't play the video because that tends to not be very successful. Okay. Good to know. Thanks, Susan. Okay, so if you want to go ahead and watch that video now, uh, the bit.ly was posted, and it's also on the screen here. So, and Susan, I'm just going to go back. I believe this one is about, if Longer you want to set the seconds. timer, yeah, the timer, three, three minutes, 28 seconds. If we want to set the timer, Yep, I can possible. do that. Thank you very much. So again, hopefully everyone saw the link, and that'll just walk you through the 12-second dialogue. Okay. Hopefully most of you have seen that. Um, we're not going to do that one, but I would like to talk to it just a little bit. Um, if you could give a green check mark, I guess, in the chat just to say that you have uh, been able to watch the video. So I know I can move on. Okay. 
Seeing lots. Uh, oh yeah, I have a ton of tutorials. <laughs> I'll share all those with you at the end, and this is available to go back to later. Um, so what I want to talk to is just, that seems really simple, where to, and Melanie, I encourage you to watch the rest later. Um, it's, it's not hard to do. You could literally watch that one with your class and then, and then work at the project. Um, so what's happening in that is that two sprites are, are talking, and to have that happen, just like when we have to use social cues or, or help someone with conversation, some students have difficulty knowing when to speak and waiting their turn, the two characters have to wait for each other and we have to put wait blocks in so that as one is speaking, the other one is waiting. And at the beginning, it's fairly simple because 12 seconds, two seconds to speak, the other one waits two seconds and two seconds to speak seems rather easy, um, but it, it, yes, you can use it uh, Beatrice, you can use it on Scratch Junior. The only thing is it's not seconds on Scratch Junior, so the students will adjust to that, but you can definitely have conversation happening, and you can do that on Scratch Junior as well. Um, what I like to do with, with Scratch, though, is I like to then, after they've done it once, I'll say, okay, so I see you've done two seconds, and they've, it's all two seconds. So I say, is there any other ways you could do it? So what they're doing in changing the dialogue and having one speak longer and then the other speak shorter, they're creating a situation where they're adding in different ways to 12. And so we come back to that at the end and then we talk about, well, how many different ways did you have a 12 second dialogue? So what we're really doing was finding a whole bunch of different ways to add up to 12. And for some students to find this easy, then it's, it's not hard to give them a bigger challenge and say, all right, we'll use three sprites. As soon as they're using three sprites, it, it becomes quite a bit more complex and they have to think about it more. So you can use this with longer periods of time. There's a lot of different ways you can use it. But it's a good way for students to get used to the blocks of code and it's very similar to Scratch Junior. So it's kind of a good way to, to step them into Scratch. So this project, I'm actually going to have you work with me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a bit of how to get started and then I'm going to turn you loose and we'll give you about uh, five to seven minutes to just play with the, the program itself and to try it out. So I'm going to go live now and we're hoping that that's going to work well and I'll take you to counting to ten in Scratch. Uh, this is another one that's useful for students. It's something you're doing in math class anyways and I mean counting to ten is, is fairly simple as far as grade one goes. If you're in grade three, it, it might be a, a vastly different number. It could be with multiplication. There's a lot of different ways you could use it. Um, so let's go and see what that looks like. And once I've shown it to you, I, I encourage you to go and try yourself. All right, excellent. So, hopefully everyone can see this on their screen, and I'm just going to create. When you go to this in a couple of minutes, you will have, you will have your account probably signed in because you just signed up on Chrome, so if you didn't close it, you'll already be signed in. And if not, it, doesn't, it just takes a minute to sign in, and then you can save your project. So, for this, the first thing I'm going to do is actually get rid of the cat. I don't need the cat to do this. So I'll just delete my cat. And I'm going to grab a sprite. I want something fairly small. So basketball will do. And something we can do with sprites is we can shrink them because often with math, we want them to see the math. So if I tap on these arrows, up here on the screen. You put them in the center of the sprite and you start shrinking your sprite down until it's fairly small. And another thing we can do actually is we can clone a, not clone, but we can duplicate a sprite. A right click allows you to duplicate. And so I can have two of these, three of these. You can really have as many as you want. And then if we find a space we want them to be on the screen, say right here, 
this is basketball two. And if I don't know which one it is, if I click down here on the actual sprite below, it will flash on the screen. And I want this to be where it starts. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go to the event blocks. And a lot of our programs will start on green flag clicked. I'm going to create a reset script right now. I'm going to pull over when space key pressed. And then I'm going to put in wherever this sprite is right now, this character on the screen, the X and the Y, which is X is from left to right, and Y is from the top to the bottom. It's, it's where it is on this grid. And that spot right now, we have in motion blocks, go to X minus 160, Y 112, positive 112. So if I click on that lock, even if it's not attached, it'll make the sprite go there. And if I attach it to spacebar, when I click the spacebar, then it moves it. And it's not going anywhere because it's already in that spot. But if I move it over and press the spacebar, it puts it back where it started. Scratch does not do that with the sprites, and it can be very frustrating for students. So this is one of the first things I show them. Okay. So X is minus 160, and Y is 112. Now, I'm going to drag this over and drop it into the first basketball. And when I click on the first basketball, here it is here. Now, if I press space key, one of the basketballs disappeared, but it didn't really. It just went to the exact same space. So I need to change one of these numbers, and it's not the X number, it's the Y number. So if I make it, instead of 112, I make it 130, and then I press the space bar, I can see that they're overlapping. And so for the students, they just they guess and check. They work with the numbers to try and figure it out. So even in just placing a sprite, they're using math and they're figuring out where it needs to go. So now I have a space between my two sprites. And so if I use this information and change the 112 to 110, now I can talk to the students about 110, 140, where do you think the next sprite will go? So they're thinking about the math in this. So they can figure out the difference between 10 and 40 is 30, and then they can add the 30 onto 140. So again, if I take this over and drop it on basketball three, hundred and forty and thirty is hundred and seventy. And if I'm worried that that's too high, I can go the opposite way. So it was 110, and I could try 80, and it moves it down. So then the final basketball, I'm going to go 30 less than 80 and make the Y value 50. Okay, so now I have four sprites. And what I want to do is I want to make all these sprites count to 10. Um, in different ways. So they're showing different ways of counting to 10. I go to the event blocks. I'm going to run it when the green flag click. And what I need to do, I need to move, but before I move, I need to draw a line. So I'm going to say pen down. And for students, it's important to try this. So oftentimes, They'll do motion first, and they'll say, OK, I want you to move 30 steps. And then, put the, and then they'll put the pen down underneath. And so it's really great. It's computational. They have to think about how come it, it didn't draw the, the line where I wanted it to. And it's basically because it put the pen down afterwards. And you'll see that the line stays. So I'm going to add to this. I'm going to add a clear. So in pen, I can add clear. So when I press the space bar, 
it clears the screen so that they can start the project over again. So move 30 steps is going to happen after we put the pen down. Now, in order to show two different numbers that they're adding, what we're going to do is we're going to change the pen shade or the pen color by a certain amount. Both work. Um, I find colors better because it's clearer and easier to see. And we're going to move again. 70 more steps. So let's see what that looks like. So it's there, I can see it, but it's not super clear. So then we talk about that and students can also set the pen size. Now I caution you not to use change pen size by because what ends up happening, it looks like a ray gun shooting, shooting, which students love, but it really isn't related to the math. So we use set pen size and I find five works really well. It's fairly clear. So if you click in the circle and change it to five, and sometimes people at this point, they'll go and they'll click the green flag and nothing happens. Because the cursor is still inside the circle, uh, the it, Scratch program doesn't know that you're ready to run it. So you have to click outside of that area and then click the green flag. And before I do that, I'm going to reset by pressing the space bar. So now I'm going to run the program. There we go. So steps are pixels. And pixels on the screen are very, very small. So I talked to the students about 30 is representing 3, and 70 is representing 7. So 3 plus 7 equals, and then that's 10. So this is one way to show 10. Um, if you want to save time when you go to try this program, you can take this whole stack of blocks and you can drop it over the other sprites and then all you really have to do is change the 30 and the 70. One more thing you can do is go to looks and at the end you can have your sprite hide so that it becomes invisible and we're just seeing a line where we added 3 and 7. So let's look at that now. Click the green flag, and there's 3 plus 7. Uh, to reinforce the students, you add a show block to your space, go to this, clear and show, brings it back again. Um, I talked to students about this. Adding a comment, you right click in this space, you can add a comment and say that 3 plus 7 equals 10. That way when they share it with me later, I can see that they understood the math and that 30 represents 3. Uh, so what they're doing is they're going to have 1 plus 9, 2 plus 8, 3 plus 7, 4 plus 6. And as they do so, you can even have them start to move the sprites around so, or change the code. So they're doing it in an, in an order so that they can see with the colors what they're doing. So I'd like to invite you to go and work on that program for a bit. And then any questions that you're having, you could post on the, on the, in the chat and I could, I could troubleshoot for you. So if you want to go to this program now and give it a try, um, it will give you, uh, Susan, maybe five minutes just for time if we give them five minutes to work at this.
Scott, there's a couple of questions in the chat that I can't answer. Okay, thank you. Oh, no, sorry, thank you. Uh, Beatrice, I don't use Scratch, only Scratch Junior. Do you have a project I can see? Um, I don't have a project you can see here uh, with this. You can't use the pen in Scratch Junior, and that's one of the big drawbacks for me, is that you can't use the, the pen function. So if possible, if you could try this with your students in Scratch, if you have access to computers or Chromebooks, and if you don't, I'm, I'm sorry, there, there's other things you can do with it, but the pen is something it doesn't have. Uh, getting rid of a sprite is uh, right click and delete. Joe's already hit that one. Thanks, Joe. You only have access to mini iPads. Okay, um, so Scratch Junior, you can do some of the things we're doing tonight, but pen down isn't something that it has as a function at this time. Um, hopefully within a year, Scratch will be able to work on iPads. That's the hope. If you accidentally delete code, um, you you just have to write it again. It doesn't take very long uh, to reset the code to the to the what it was before. Is that what you're asking? Um, if you've really messed it up, then just kind of go back to the project page and start over because you are remixing my project. So if you go back to the original link, you can start over fresh with the code. To reset the balls before the lines are drawn. Ah, right. I'll show you. Ah, and Joe's saying there's an edit, undo, undelete. Oh, well, there you go. I've never used that, so that's awesome. Okay. So... So resetting is going back to that original um, X, Y space that you want it to go back to. And it doesn't really matter where you place that as long as it has room to draw the lines. Otherwise, it's not really a big deal. But you want the X to be the same for each one for the students just so visually they're seeing things clearly. Reducing the size of the sprites. If you, I'm just going to show my sprites. So if you go to the top here, if you can see on the screen the shrink, and you click on the shrink and bring it down, you just have to keep it in the center. Okay, um, I apologize because I know most of you are, are just kind of getting into this and hopefully, uh, Joe, are you able to pre-create a code template and assign it to students? Uh, yes, yeah. so what I do is I just share my project with them and then what they do is they remix it. When they get to the program, they remix it. So the same way I'm sharing it with you tonight, uh, when they get the project, for them to actually save it, they have to remix it. Um, so I can put... Um, most of the code in and have them work on small parts of it or give them less code depending on how, what, where they are, like scaffolding the learning. Sometimes, Joe, I have three different projects, the same one, but I have one that's really scaffolded for some students to struggle. I have it with almost nothing in it for my strongest coders or strongest math students. And in that way, you can, you can have uh, three or four different things happening in the room with the same project just how much help you're giving the students. Okay. 
So the next project, I'm not going to show this tonight, but I encourage you to, to watch the video afterwards. Um, this is the video tutorial, and this is the link to the Scratch project. And what it's doing is it's showing how to take the Make 10 project and then turn it into a growing, shrinking pattern. And so they can try to create a pattern with the, sh with the colors, create a pattern with the numbers. So if the numbers increase, uh, the first one's 10, then the next two numbers add to 11, next two numbers add to 12, next two numbers add to 13, they can see that the pattern grows and then have them shrink back down to 10. Um, that's just an extension. You can also, for more advanced students, have them try to move the shapes so they're moving in different directions and have them create a fan. So the fan effect happens because the lines in the middle are longer and the lines on the ends are shorter. So there's a lot you can do with this. This will be available after tonight. Um, only for time's sake, I'm not going to go into that now. So this is something that can be done on, uh, in Scratch Junior as well. But what I'm going to show now is um, creating a repeating pattern. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through how to do this one now. And um, I won't, there won't be time for you to try it, but I'll show you how it works. And then you could go in and play with it uh, later tonight or tomorrow, and hopefully that will work for you. So I'm going to switch it over again. Okay, so hopefully everyone's seeing making a pattern with stamps on the screen. And what I do for my students as well, I do write in here. Sometimes I write this more for teachers that are going to use the program, and sometimes more for students. It just depends on my intended audience. So here's a sample of making a simple pattern with the stamp block. And then can you change the pattern to make it your own? So the nice thing about Scratch is the attributes are easy to show with the characters. and so my questions to the students are, what are three things you changed? Can you describe the pattern to a friend? Can they recreate your, their pa your pattern from your description? So basically at that point, they're sharing coding blocks with another student. They're sharing what blocks they used, and the other student tries to recreate their program. So here I have my sprite. And I pre-shunk the sprite, so when you click on this project, the cat's already small for you, and he's already over in the corner. Um, I just did that to kind of get people started. And then here's my reset right here. When space key pressed, go back to the space and show. And I've got that for some reason twice. So we'll get rid of that. OK. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to have it run on the green flag. So we call these event blocks hat blocks because you can't place any code above these. This is the one that will start the program, and there's different times that we can do that. But this runs a script. And so when green flag clicked is the most common one, and that's the one we use most of the time. And we often use space key just to reset everything. The students get used to that, and then when they're using each other's programs, they're fairly easy to use, and they, they don't have to write all that in the description. So the first thing we want to know is that under the pen, we can stamp. So if I pull out a stamp right now, and I move my cat, and this is trial and error for the students to kind of guess and check, they have to figure out how many steps do I have to move so that I can see the first part of the pattern. So there, I can see the cat stamped. And by default, the cat points in direction 90 degrees, which is to the right. Um, so that's kind of a default thing that happens in the program. So the first thing the cat's doing is it is, is pointing to the right, and he moves forward. So then the next thing I want to do is I'm going to have the cat do something different now. So I might want to change something about the cat. And if I go to looks, I can find change color effect. So if I change this by, say, 75, there's a lot of computational thinking that comes out in this project. 
because they really have to think through everything they're doing. So when I stamp my cat with the color change, then I move. And often they'll mix these blocks up at the beginning and they have to debug their program. They have to look and figure out what's not working. So again, it's moving 50 steps. And then I can check and see what's happened. So the cat stays green, and I don't want the cat to stay green. I want the cat to change back. So a block that's important is in the looks. We can clear the graphic effects and take the color away. So if I reset my program and run it again, so I've had my cat change, move 50 steps, change color, and then move 50 steps again. So this is not a stamp, this is a sprite. Uh, after that, I might want to do something else. So what I could add on is possibly changing Well, there's a lot. Actually, and your students will find stuff you never thought of as well, which is really neat. Uh, it's kind of cool. But you can have it change size by. You can set the size to a certain percent. So right now the cat's at 45%, but I can make the cat 75% of his original size. So just showing you what the sprite looks like, if I do this, then we've changed the size. So again, the students have to remember to stamp it, and then they have to move again. And of course, if they don't shrink the cat after, then they're going to have trouble. So the easy one is, is that's quick is clear graphic effects again. We can put that right after the stamp. So I'll just run this again. Oh, and it didn't work. Sorry. So we'll set the size back to 45%. And we talk about this a lot in class. The students is everything isn't going to work the first time. Sometimes we grab the wrong block. Something we think will work doesn't, and we just troubleshoot. And they, they stay very calm when they're doing it because they're, they know it's an expected part of the program, and it's helpful for them. So it's not resetting the size. So I can put that in the reset as well. So anything that you need to have changed back, you can use the space key to reset everything. So there, I've, I've had three things happen in my pattern. And this is where someone asked, when do you introduce blocks? Well, here's where I would introduce a control block. And if a pattern's going to happen, with the students I talk about this, I say, I have the root or the core of the pattern, but it's, is it a pattern yet? And they'll say no. And they'll say it has to repeat. And so then we put a repeat block in, and it'll repeat everything twice. And if I want to be really good, I can also hide the sprites. I'm only seeing the pattern at the end. And I put the show in with the reset script so that it'll come back. So we'll reset and run this. So I've created a pattern. And uh, this is just scratching the surface. The students will find tons of ways, tons of attributes to change with their sprites. OK. So I'm just trying to read over, uh, trying to read through the comments. OK. Mallory, yes. Um, and I'll tell you, I don't try to be perfect with the students either. I mean, I, I happily start a project having not done it before, showing them that we all work through that process. And uh, how do you reset, uh, Jody? So to reset, I run a separate script. I had it on the screen, and I was pressing the space bar. And it clears the graphic effects. It, it brings the sprite back. It basically undoes everything that I've changed. And that's, again, for the students, they have to think through all the things they're changing on the sprite. And they add all those blocks in so that it resets everything at the end. 
Yes, you have the code do the reset. And I'll just jump back over and show you. Okay. If I scroll over here. So you can see, and we'll zoom this in a bit. So this is my reset script that sets everything back to the beginning. So when the space key is pressed, go back to this X and Y position on the grid, point in direction 90, which is right, set size to 45%, clear any, clear is just getting rid of anything. Sometimes they have, they don't have them sprite draw shapes as well. Clear graphic effects and then show the sprite because I've hidden them. And it's basically troubleshooting. Uh, the students will not do everything right the first time and that's part of the process. So then they go back and they find the blocks they need to add in. And there's a lot of problem solving and troubleshooting. Okay, so let's jump on to the next project. So, and again, what I do with my students is after we've done this, what I'll do is I'll say, give them this one day on the whiteboard at the front of the room. Or what I might do is I might even um, print these off sometimes, even. Uh, at home on the color printer and bring them in and just hand them out and have the students figure out what would this sprite do and then have them draw it out or have them talk about it or even write it in words. And yes, Gail, you can definitely have them create their own reset block. Absolutely. Um, I love that. That's good. Okay. So if we can jump on. This is coding a practice clock. And what we're going to do here is we're just going to 835. Yeah. Um, we're going to look at this really, really quickly and then I'm going to move on. So I'll just show you this one super quick. And I just, I don't want to lose the time to, to show some other things. So really quickly, I'll show you what we can do with this. So practicing telling time, uh, this is basically a beginner project and then you can move forward from this and have the students actually build a working clock. I have that project as well in the links you'll get afterwards. We're not going to look at that tonight. So showing you fairly quickly, um, this is for the students and instead of just, um, I mean there's apps you can use online where they can move the hands of a clock. But this is just giving them it with code so that they can start to personalize it and do their own thing with it. And so again, it lets them practice with the code blocks. And they might decide, okay, um, for the hour hand, I'm going to use H. Okay, thank you. Um, and then how far am I going to move? And that's something that they have to think about. So hour hand. How far is it going to move? And if I move 10 steps, it's not going to do what I want. Because I'm trying to go quickly now, I'll skip showing you the wrong way and we'll just jump in here. So turning 15 degrees, what the students do at the very beginning, they'll press the H key and they'll notice that the hand only went halfway between the 12 and the 1. If you teach grade 3, you might like that and you might want that to be something that they use because it can show that when the minute hand is halfway around the hour, the hour hand is halfway between the two numbers. Um, for me though, what I want them to do is I want them to figure out if this is 15 degrees, how many degrees would take it all the way to the one? And as a class, we decided that was about halfway. And so thinking about halfway, we decided this should be 30 degrees. Now, we come back to that reset script again. So when space key pressed, I want the sprite to point in direction zero, which is up. And then if I press the H key again, oh, sorry, I didn't change the degrees. My bad. Uh, there we go. So now when I press H, it moves to the one. And then I can do the same for the minute hand. I can go to the events. And now I'm going to say when the M key 
is pressed. And again, and it just depends on your grade level, what you would have them turn. And for me, it's to five minutes, although we often get down to one minute. And then from here, they can, if I tell them, okay, I want you to show me 120, then they show me 120. Then what you can do with advance for the students is say, now can you create another script that will have the hand move backwards when you press a different key. And so they can have it so the hands are moving back and forth and practicing. What's nice about this is even though this is just a basic clock and pretty quick to code, the nice thing is after they do this, then what they can do is they can turn it into a timer or try to get the hands to go to continuously around the clock. There's a lot more they can do with it, but you can use it as a, as a basic practice tool as well at the beginning. So I'm going to move on. Are there any questions popping up? Okay, so moving on to, and this is the working clock, which I encourage you to try afterwards. Um, and this is where I have my students make a block. Uh, were the minute hands and hour hands sprites? Yes. And Jody, it's, it's actually a little bit tricky to make the clock. So I pre-built this project for the students. And the sprites, um, they're, they're set at x0, y0. So you can use that in the reset. It will take it back to where it's pointing at right now. Makes it easy for students. Um, and I should go over that, I believe, in the video tutorial. But that lets them, because they will pull those sprites out, and then putting it back to x0, y0 will reset it. So we're not going to do this one tonight, but I encourage you to check this out later. And it's, it's fun for the students. And they, they have, my students did a 24-hour clock. And they got the code to work so that the clock would turn for 24 hours. So they're thinking about 24 hours in a day. They were thinking about 60 minutes in an hour, 60 seconds in a minute. All of that math that we want them to think about was coming out while they were trying to also do the coding. OK, and this is just an example. One of the students in my class, she wanted to understand she's practicing the numbers. So what she did was she added on in her program, because she can, she can modify. And she put a 5 beside the 1, a 10 beside the 2, so that she could easily remember what she was counting by. And it helped her. She scaffolded for herself her own project so that she could be successful. Um, and I just thought that was great that she has the know-how to do that. And she threw that in, and it helped her to, be, to do a good job of telling time. And speaking of time, I'm going to keep moving. Um, all right, graphing a snowman. I can't show you this one live because it runs too fast um, for the screen to keep up. So what I need to do is we're going to watch the video tutorial for this one, um, snowman dash. I would ask you to watch the video tutorial. And then what I will show you is how to build a pictograph afterwards. This project, they're basically playing a game. And they change the math in the game to speed it up to make the game more challenging. And in doing that, it, they play with numbers, and they're thinking about how the numbers affect the sprites in the game. So there's a lot of math that happens. But then we take the data that they've recorded, and we put it on a pictograph, which they can also do in Scratch. So I'd ask you to watch that video now. I could, or we could just have people give us a green check please. mark when they come back. Then I won't under overestimate the time. Yes. Yeah. That'd be wonderful. That's a great idea. Thank you. So if you want to give a green check after you've watched the video, the link is up. Snowman Dash, thank you.
Okay, I see the numbers climbing now. Uh, Susan, should I carry on? I think considering it's almost 10 to 9, I would say yes. Okay. All right. Um, so <laughs> I apologize if you haven't seen the entire video. Um, graphing the snowmen. So what this is, it's basically, for the sake of time, I'm just going to show you. Uh, there's sprites, and then what they do is they stamp the sprites, and in class they can tally who lasts 10 seconds up to, up to 10 seconds, and then tally students who last up to 20 seconds and 30. They can go to different classes, and then your pictograph, instantly what you have to start doing is you have to start allowing for maybe, maybe you don't have enough, so you start talking about scale and, and how many each picture is going to represent. Uh, they create the extra second blocks once people start lasting longer. And there is a video tutorial that walks you through that. And just for the sake of time, I am going to move on. So um, we have here what shape geometry quiz and parallel or congruent. So I have time, I think, to show one. And why don't we show what shape geometry quiz? Uh, all the links and all the videos are available later. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you to what shape. I'm going to take you right into the Scratch project now and just go over it quickly. And the video will walk you through it completely later. Um, I apologize for the timing, but I'll try to get it in as much as I can. All these links are shared with you. In the end, uh, you'll be getting the resource with You'll be, get, you'll be getting all the information and have that. So geometry quiz. And again, right here it explains it at the top. Oh, are we all seeing the same thing? Yes, OK, good. So uh, input output functions with an ask and wait block. Uh, so what that does is now the user of the program inputs information, which changes how the, the program reacts. So this is a really neat thing for them to learn. Uh, they don't understand all the code at the beginning, and then they can use it. And can we create a class through teacher account? Yes. Uh, you can assign different projects to different students. Uh, you can post projects in there. Um, I, you, you'll, see, you'll see the choices you have there. You can also post it through uh, Google Classroom, actually. Um, OK. So if I jump into the program now, this is, the, this is the blocks of code that I wouldn't expect students to know right away. And what I do is I just introduce parts of it so that they start to work with parts of it. Um, and what happens in this game when they press the green flag to start the game, here comes the script. Help Tom get rid of the shapes by answering the questions. If he is touched, it's game over. So the circle comes down and asks, how many sides does the circle have? So they're practicing all that all those uh, geometry things that we want them to think about. And if I get the right answer, it says correct, and it vanishes. Then a triangle comes down and asks what shape it is. And this is a great one because they all spell triangle E-L, and I, I want them to remember the L-E. So when they're playing it in a game, it becomes very important to them to get it correct. Um, so you can see here that as it comes down, I can see the, if I click to the sprite, I can see what the correct answer is. So it is important for the students, that digital citizenship piece, that they know the answers are there, but maybe they leave it in full screen and play fairly. Uh, they get really good at spelling triangle because they want to succeed at this. And then here comes a square. Now, if they get this wrong, they have to start over from the beginning again, which is very frustrating. So if they somehow forget, game over. And then they have to go all the way back to the beginning. Um, so that also gets that repetition and that, that repeated practice, which is really important. So what happens is they get better at strong triangle because each time they, they fail in the game, then they start over and they, they start to remember how to spell it because they're just doing it repetitively because they want to succeed in the game. Um, what they have to do later is, when they get to the rectangle, they have to start putting in the ask and wait. So here's where they have to ask a question for the rectangle and put an answer in. Um, this is scaffolding it so that they're starting to use the blocks. And then in this program, it's also where I introduce broadcasting. It's something they use in Scratch Junior. 
Uh, the video tutorial goes over that, but then they have to introduce it that after the shape is finished, there's a broadcast that will be sent out and it will run up at the top here. It's when I receive the broadcast, rectangle go, I start. So at the end it would say send the broadcast message, hexagon go, and they would add that in. So we do introduce the coding concepts in the program and doing this at the same time we're introducing math concepts. To create these shapes, I did them in Google Drawing. I downloaded them as PNG files, which you can then upload into Scratch. That's also how this uh, this man over here appeared. I we we created our own characters from storybooks we're reading, uh, chapter books. They created a character and they were coding like a story with the character. And so they created their own characters in Google Drawing, and then they can upload those into Scratch. And so that's easy to make the different shapes. It makes it a lot easier for the students. Uh, you can also have all the shapes you want them to use, or just get them started and let them add the shapes in. Okay, uh, Susan, how much time do I have left? Well, I, I only need a minute, so you can go right till nine. Okay, uh, if everybody's uh, game, I'll show one more thing then. For a typical coding session with your class, how much time do you block? Uh, Joe, I, I, at least an hour, but if I can, I'll even do two hours. You'll be surprised. There's there's not really any students that are complaining that they haven't had that they've had been on it too long. If anything, they're they're trying to work at lunchtime. They want to keep going. If they haven't completely succeeded, they don't want to put it away. They want to stay in and keep working on it. But once you get going and you kind of break it down into smaller pieces, then they'll do usually about an hour. 40-minute blocks, that's all I get. Well, then just, yeah, do half of it. Do half the project. Do one section, and then they come back, and they do the next section. And you'll be surprised how many of them will go home and work on it at home and log in, and then bring it back and, and have it finished. Um, but, yeah, that is, that is unfortunate, 40 minutes. Okay, uh, so one more thing. I'm just going to keep the screen up here. This is sorting 2D shapes. And this is for uh, me, myself, in grade three. Uh, we introduce, so we have one side, all sides congruent, other side is parallel, but then what shapes are parallel and congruent? So following both sides. And I couldn't draw a Venn diagram. I'm not particularly talented at art. So I put a triangle at the bottom, and we consider this the overlap in the Venn diagram. So if you can allow me that the triangle is the overlap, and what I did was I pre-built some of the sprites already. So if I press the green flag, then we've had some shapes that have already drawn. And so in drawing these, it gives them enough clues with the code that what they can do is carry on, and they can have the other ones create more shapes. And then what they do is they can drag this, this shape. They remove the go to XY from the space key pressed. So I'll just show you by clearing it now, but the red bow is a square. So if I reset and then pull this out, if it's a square, it has all sides parallel and all sides congruent. So it would actually go down here. And so I place it down here, and now when I clear it, it'll stay down there. And then if I press the green flag again, the square is in the right place. So it's got all sides congruent and it's parallel. And then I see here that this blue bow tie has got a pentagon. So if I pull that over here, and again, I'll remove the go to x, y. And then all I really have to do is draw it there. And it has all sides congruent but none parallel. Uh, what really, really helped my students uh, with understanding congruent and parallel was actually the code. So in teaching them the code, they started to understand, well, if it's always, if it's always doing the same thing, uh, then those sides, if it's doing the exact same movement of 20 steps each time, then those sides are congruent because they're all exactly the same. And then they start to figure it out and they understand that something like a parallelogram they can see by the code that the exact angles are repeated and it visually draws it and they can, they can understand better what parallel means. And then in looking here, they see that none of the sides are directly across from each other and it, it just it really clarifies it. And what I do with the students is 
again, there's a video tutorial for this later. So please uh, go back. I'm going very fast now. I apologize. But um, what I do after doing parallel congruent is then what I do is I create these um, these little cards and I just print off right off the sc I screen uh, print and print off these cards, cut them out, and bring them into class. And they figure out what shape has been made by what the code says. And in addition to that, they can also tell me if it's parallel or congruent just by what the code says. So it gives them that deeper understanding. OK. Um, questions, comments, thoughts? Hopefully I've given you something useful or something you can take back to your class tonight. So I'm just going to butt in because I, I put in the comments uh, a second ago that I suspect you'll probably stick around, Scott. So if any of you have any questions after after we yes. just do the closing, um, we will uh, we'll both hang around. So um, Scott, I just want to say that was an awesome session. No one would ever know that was your first webinar. Um, I'm just going to post that link that's on there because we've discovered that the uh, slides are actually just screenshots. But there's Oh, sorry. Shoot. That's OK. I'm going to um, put your link back in a minute. So I'm just okay. going to do my closing here. Um, yeah. We need your feedback. So there's a link in the chat to a feedback survey, particularly for those of you that have never attended an OTF Connects webinar. The surveys help them to um, drive their, their future programming. So it gives them great feedback in terms of you know what you liked and what you need and, and what would bring you back to OTF Connect. So we really appreciate that. It also helps to drive their funding. So we would really appreciate that. You can print a certificate. Some of you still collect uh, professional portfolio folders. So you can print yourself a certificate after you do the feedback. And the resource link that I've been talking about that will include the recording of this session and all of the resources that Scott has shared uh, will be live. It's actually live now. It says updated by noon tomorrow. Not everything is there yet. That's one of my jobs for after the session tonight. Um, but Scott, that was a fantastic session. Um, so rich in resources. And I had encouraged Scott to just go ahead and put it all in. And we'll get to as much as we get to. And I think that we accomplished uh, an awful lot. I think you've got a great sense of what Scratch can do. And Scott, you're you're really good at you know, empowering people and making them feel like this is great. The curriculum connections were excellent. Um, so just thank you very much for, for super work. And thank you to all of you as well. There was a lot of back and forth tonight from listening to Scott and then going out and trying things. And I could certainly tell from the chat that you were really involved and in gaining a lot out of it. So thank you to all of you as well. I'm going to stop the recording. And then if we have any further group questions for Scott or for each other, we can certainly do that. So again, thank you, everyone. Thank you, particularly Scott. And uh, have a great night. <laughs>